Pastor's Corner teaching series. And in this series, we have been examining the various books of the minor prophets. So before the Christmas break, we had gone through a, b- a bunch of the prophets already. And if you want to go back and look at any of those uh, in our previous playlist, you can go ahead and do that. Uh, if you're joining us today, we're going to be looking at the book of Nahum. It's a shorter book. It's about three chapters long. And today, as we look at that, uh, we're going to examine some of the backdrop to it and some of the various pieces of this book. So at this point, if you're, as always, if you're able, I just want to invite you to pause here and read the book of Nahum before we continue. Well, let's get into some of the backdrop details of this book. This book is written by the prophet Nahum. His ma- name means consolation, and it's the idea that uh, in the midst of something bad, there's something to console us. It's the idea of maybe being sanguine uh, during this time. Uh, there is, uh, at the same time, the prophet Jeremiah, the prophet Habakkuk, and the prophet Zephaniah who are prophesying. Uh, Jeremiah and Zephaniah are prophesying to the southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah, and uh, they're giving the prophecy there. What's different with Nahum is that as he's prophesying, he's actually giving the judgment of God uh, to one of Israel's greatest enemies, the Assyrian Empire. And this empire uh, of Assyria, the capital city, is Nineveh. So what that should spark in us is the idea of going back to the book of Jonah. And when you go back to the book of Jonah, uh, God instructs Jonah to go prophesy to the city of Nineveh, the capital city of Assyria. And they repent and they relent and they change. And so God withholds his judgment. At this point now, Nahum is tasked to go talk uh, about the coming judgment of God to the Assyrian Empire, to uh, the Ninevites, and all in in the context of Judah seeing what's happening. And therefore, at this point, God is going to bring his full judgment on the nation of Assyria. What we know of Nahum at this point is that he is um, the son of Elkoshite. We don't know much about him other than that. Uh, We also know that maybe this book is written at around 630 to 612 uh, BC. Uh, At this point in time in history, Assyria, the empire of Assyria, has grown to great capacity. It is the uh, it's the impending empire of the day, and they have already taken out the northern kingdom of Israel. So the north has already fallen, uh, Judah still remains, and at this t- uh, time now, um, Assyria is becoming this world power, but they're also beginning to decline. And eventually what we'll see is that the Babylonian empire will rise up and overtake uh, the Assyrian empire. Uh, and so you can read about Assyria and their defeat. You can look at that in Second Kings verse 17. Uh, This book, Nahum, is divided neatly into three sections. Uh, These three sections are actually listed as your three chapters. And so we're going to go through them right now very quickly and just to highlight some of the areas for us to see and understand what's going on. All right, so as we look at chapter one, there's a couple things for us to take into consideration. The first thing is this. Chapter one really is a description of the character and the power of God. If you take the opportunity to look through verses 1 through 8, you have all these wonderful and beautiful descriptions of this all-powerful God and what his purpose and what his plan is. Um, With that, what we have is actually in the Hebrew, this alphabetical poem. It's an incomplete poem because it doesn't go through all the alphabet, but it kind of has this image of using different alphabetical letters to start. And so it talks about God's appearance and his all-powerful nature. I want to highlight for you, particularly verse 3, it says this, The Lord is slow to anger, but great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. His way is in the whirlwind and the storm, and clouds are the dust of his feet. That description there, uh, if you ever take the time to parallel it, it goes back to the book of Exodus, chapter 34, verses 6 and 7. And, And those two images just parallel each other. Again, this is the same God who delivered Israel. It's the same God who continues Uh, to have his plans and purposes come to fruition. And so we have this image of God's character. And what's going to happen then is also in verses um, 8 through 9 and verse 14, there's this weird uh, dynamic of how Nahum kind of reads and describes this image. Here's what it says. Uh, But with an overwhelming flood, he will make an end of Nineveh. He will pursue his foes into the realm of darkness. Whatever they plot against the Lord, he will bring to an end. Trouble will not come a second time. Verse 14, the Lord has given a command concerning you, Nineveh. You will have no descendants to bear your name. I will destroy the images and idols that are in the temple of your gods. I will prepare your grave for the vile. And so what we have here is some images of this judgment. This judgment is, again, it's on the nation of Assyria, it's particularly in the capital city of Nineveh. But what happens also is 
is in verse 15. Look, there on the mountains, the feet of one who brings good news, who proclaims peace. Celebrate your festivals, Judah, and fulfill your vows. No more will the wicked invade you. They will be completely destroyed. And there's this call to celebrate even that the enemies of Israel will fall. And, and it's, it's kind of weird to hear that, but um, this is how far gone uh, this nation of Assyria has gone. God has given them warning. God has given them every chance. And now his judgment is going to come uh, to fruition. Uh, and so what's going to happen there is that Babylon is the empire that will rise up and they will overthrow and take over the Assyrian empire. But even then, it's not going to be as good as we think because after the Babylonian empire, they too uh, were going to destroy Judah. And then after them would come the Medo-Persian empire. And after them would come the Greco-Roman empires. And, and even to today, there hasn't been sort of a world empire that has taken over uh, that sort of uh, idea. But God's reign and rule and his sovereignty are what we see at the backdrop of all this. Because all these nations will rise and all these nations will fall. But God's kingdom and God himself as king will continue to go on through eternity, present and future. And so this is the, some of the images that we can see. So in chapter 1, verse 7, we also have something that will be interesting for us to keep our, our pulse on. It says, The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. Whenever there's a judgment of God, there's still always an opportunity for a what's called a faithful remnant. If that we hear God and we repent and we are humble, uh, God will intervene and save those who do that. And so even in the midst of this great judgment that's coming upon Nineveh, if God finds that there is a remnant of people willing to repent and, and come humbly to him, he will be faithful to them. And, and that's just something that we always have to have in the backdrop of every single one of these prophetic judgments that God gives. There is still always an opportunity for repentance and to come back to God in humility. And he continues and will be faithful to each person who does that. So chapter 1 gives us this image of the character and power of God and the beginnings of the overthrow of the great city of Nineveh. As we turn our attention to chapter 2, what we have here is a description of how the city of Nineveh is going to fall. Verses 1 through 4 give us some descriptions of their preparations. There's going to be this great preparation of the city to get ready for battle. They're going to get their weapons together, their, their armor and their chariots and get everything together. Uh, but what happens after that in verses 5 through 7 is the very fact that all of that is futile, that they will eventually fall. And what this just sort of gives us is this indication that, again, we can prepare, you can prepare for uh, what's to come, but God is ultimately in control of this situation. All their weapons and preparations for the invasion, all their weapons and preparations to defend themselves will be futile because at the end of the day, it is God's judgment that is coming upon them. Nineveh has ever had every opportunity to repent. Nineveh has had every opportunity to change their ways, and they haven't. So now the judgment of God is going to come upon them. Uh, and so in verses 8 and following, you have then the description of how the entire city gets sacked, completely destroyed, um, and every one of their inhabitants will flee. Um, what this gives us is that in about 612 BC, the Babylonian Empire, Empire does come in and completely destroy the Assyrian Empire. And they take over as the world power at this point. And, and again, eventually the nation of Judah themselves will go into exile to the Babylonians uh, because of their, also, their in unwillingness to repent as well. Uh, in chapter 3, what we have then is the reasons for why Nineveh will be destroyed, the reasons why the Assyrian Empire would fall. Um, in chapters 3, verses 1 to 4, there's a, this pronouncement of woe, and, and uh, what we have there is just how much sin has gone on. I want to read that for us. Woe to the city of blood, full of lies, full of plunder, never without victims, the crack of whips, the clatter of wheels, galloping horses and joining, uh, jolting chariots. Charging cavalry, flashing swords and glittering spears, many casualties, piles of dead, bodies without numbers, people stumbling over the corpses, all because the wanton lust of a prostitute alluring the mistress of sorceries who enslaved nations by her prostitution and peoples by her witchcraft. Verse 5 says, I am against you, declares the Lord. I will lift your skirts over your face and I will show the nations your nakedness and the kingdoms your shame. 
And what we have here is because of the sin of this nation, the violence that they perpetuate, the oppression of other people that they um, allow to happen, the injustices that they cause and also continue to do to mistreat others, all of that is their sin issue that God has called them to and God is calling them to account. And so what you have then in verses 8 through 11 is the descriptions of other nations that have also fallen because of God's uh, justice. Um, if, if the nations perpetuate violence, oppression, injustice, when they perpetuate hate and the destruction of people, God doesn't stand idly by. God will do something. And so... In verses uh, 12 to 13, we have all their, their fortresses are like fig trees with their ripe fruit. When they are shaken, the figs fall into the mouth of the, the eater. Look at the troops. They are all weaklings. The gates of your land are wide open to your enemies. Fire has consumed the bars of your gates. Draw water for the seed, strengthening for your defense. Work the clay, tread the mortar, repair the brickwork. The fire will consume you and the sword will cut you down. They will devour you like a swarm of locusts, multiply like grasshoppers, multiplying like locusts. And so everything that the, the nation can do as their stronghold, all the things that they relied upon, their food, their water, their wealth, their, their ability to fight, all of that is useless because none of those things will save Nineveh. Because at the end of the day, again, it is God's way that's going to work. The last um, two verses give us a very, uh, very gloomy picture. The king of Assyria, your shepherds slumber, your nobles lie down to rest. Your peoples are scattered on mountains and no one to gather them. Nothing can heal you. Your wound is fatal. All you who hear the news about you will clap their hands at your fall. For who has not felt your endless cruelty? So there's the, the indictment. The judgment has come. And even to the point that when this nation falls, when the city falls, people are going to celebrate because that's how cruel you have been. And what we can take away from this is this very simple fact that God's way is just going to be the one that endures. The nations around that cause violence, oppression, injustice, that hurt people, to manipulate people, to use people, God will not allow that to continue on. God's kingdom is going to be different. God's way will be different. And God's is about just justice. It's about lifting up. It's about selflessness. It is about love. It is about care for your fellow man. And so God is going to use this nation as an example that when they fall, God's again proving himself to be the one who's behind the scenes, who is the one who will ensure that anyone who takes these kinds of actions will not go unpunished. And that's how God is judging this nation. What that means for you and for me is a simple practical application of how are we as God's people, how are we consciously thinking about whether or not we are uh, perpetuating these cycles of oppression, perpetuating cycles of injustice, uh, whether or not we carry hatred in our lives? Uh, these are challenges for us to consider because these are not kingdom principles that God values. These are the challenges that we're supposed to undertake to say, if we are Jesus people, we are to perpetuate a different cycle, one of equality, one of lifting others above self, one of tearing down structures and, and norms that are oppress or hurt or perpetuate poverty or perpetuate injustice or perpetuate inequality or perpetuate racism. Uh, this is the call of what it means to be a kingdom citizen. And so God has shown us here, even in the Old Testament, that that stuff will not stand. And you have these pictures of all these different nations that have come and gone over history. And if nations continue to do these things, God will not allow those nations to continue. And that's how he dealt with it in the Old Testament. His kingdom is here today, and we are invited to be a part of that kingdom. And so with that, we need to continue to keep in mind, who is this God and what is he all about? Who is this king that we serve and what values does he have? And in fact, his values are greater than any of the values we've ever seen in any of the kings that have come and gone in history past. And so this king and this kingdom, it will know no end because it is the king who is in charge of it, this great king who is eternal and who has what is better at heart for all of humanity. And the invitation as citizens of that kingdom is for us to join in to that. So that's the book of Nahum. And it's a very challenging book. It's one of consolation because in the midst of difficulty, uh, God's terrible judgment on this group uh, will come to fruition. But even in the midst of that, God is still faithful to a faithful remnant. And it's one of warning. 
Are we people who are perpetuating the same evil cycle? Or will we wake up and be a part of God's kingdom plan? And so that's it for the book of Nahum. So join us next time, next week, as we look at the book of Habakkuk. Until then, love and peace.